Do you have any idea what Hughes Virginia Crab, Carrie's Irish Pippin, and Hubbardson Nunsuch have in common? Well, they're all names of apples. Here to teach us more about this beloved fruit is orchardist Zeke Goodband with a sampling from his collection of heirloom varieties. Also today, apples take center stage in two very spectacular desserts, cinnamon swirl apple slab pie and a three-layer apple cake. Plus, pastry chef Mario Rose will make her version of baked apples, all today on Martha Bakes. Apples may seem conventional to some, but for Zeke Goodman, they are far from ordinary. Since the 1970s, he has revived more than 125 heirloom varieties of apples. And as you can see, he has brought some with him today to educate us on the subject of apples. Welcome, Zeke. Thank Very you nice for to have me. you come all the way from Vermont. How did you become an orchardist in the first place? Well, around where we lived, there were a lot of abandoned orchards. And my father had had a small orchard, and I thought I knew quite a lot about orchards back then. And I made agreements with the owners of these old orchards. I'd prune them and take care of them in exchange for whatever I could harvest. One of the orchards I went into uh, in the fall, there were uh, blue apples and teardrop-shaped apples and russet apples. Mm. And I knew from my old books that I had come across an orchard with Roxbury Russet and Ben Davis and Sheep's Nose and Blue Permain. And when I tasted them, um, I'd grown up eating Red Delicious. Uh, but when I tasted My these, least favorite apple. Uh, mine also. <laughs> but when I tasted these, it was like I'd been living uh, in a black and white world and all of a sudden someone brought in colors. How great. And how lucky for us that you are reviving many of those old varieties that are very hard to find. Of these apples, which ones are your favorites? Usually. And for what? What would you suggest we use these different ones for? Some of them are best for just eating out of hand, like Hubbardston Nunsuch. It's a sweet apple, crisp. Can I take a little piece sure, off one? Sure, oh, sure. Good. I have little. to try all these. I've never grown a Hubbardston. Oh, it's a handsome apple. Yeah, look how crispy and white. Yeah and originated in Hubbardston, Massachusetts in the early 1800s. Mm. Good for eating. Doesn't so much hold for up pies. too much for pie because it doesn't have that acidity that a right. good pie apple has. Now, Holstein, a German apple, this has a high acid, high sugar balance. And so we'd say it's a sprightly flavored apple. When it's baked, it holds up well. And we have Cox's Orange Pippin and we, the Ripston Pippin. Probably, Cox's was probably grown from a seed from a Ribston Pippin. Oh, and a then, Johnny Apple seed? Yeah. <laughs> and then the Cox's seed from a Cox's apple in Germany was used to produce the first Holstein tree. So, so growing from seed. Yes, that's but, how varieties originate. But if you want to keep them going and have another Ribston Pippin tree, mm. you've got to take a cutting from that first that tree. That is really good. It's my favorite right oh, now. Oh, it is? Oh, it's yeah. so very good. I love that. And then you have crab apples too. Yes. Generally, people don't even think that they can eat crab apples, but are they really higher in vitamin C than other apples? Yes, some of them are. And antioxidants and all. All those good yes. things. Yes. So what, which is the better one to well, eat? Well, to this, uh, this is Hughes so Virginia pretty. crab. So and it's pretty. a sweet crab apple. Most of them tend to be fairly tart. Oh, it's nice and yellow inside. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson thought that was pretty good for making hard cider. Oh, I bet. I'm thinking, toying with the idea of someday grafting my yeah. own trees, and I'd love to see how you go about grafting. So can you grow I'd some branches? I'd be happy to saw. show you. Okay. Sure. So I would bring my nursery stock or I would bring cuttings. And then when I would arrive at a new place or a new orchard, I'd go to those Macintosh trees or Red Delicious trees that were full size. Yep waiting there, and I'd cut them off at about my waist height, and I'd leave a few branches below just to keep feeding the tree. Then I'd split the trunk. Thanks. So I'd, sp I'd so, split oh, the so trunk. Oh, so you cut it off. Yep. And okay. split the trunk just like a piece of firewood. And then I use this wedge to open it up, and then I would have collected a cutting off of a uh, Ribston Pippin tree or 
Just so, a little cutting like that? Yes, just a little cutting like that. And pull out my grafting knife. So I'll make a cut, two cuts on either side, and then I'll slip that down and there, and then trim it off. And do the same thing on the other side. Hmm. And then I put it on that side, matching the cambium with the tree. And then I pull my wedge out. Then I have some wax that I'll put around here to hold the moisture in. And slice that off. Yep. And these will grow into a well, new tree. Yes, these buds. If I'd left them on the tree, the original tree, they would have just produced leaves. But when I put them on like this and cut the tops, they'll produce new shoots. And in the spring, as soon as this starts growing, I'll let uh, some of these shoots become the new trunk. And I'll let these others uh, become the lower branches. Mm -hmm. And then I'll eventually prune these lower off the branches original, off. Off the original Macintosh. Yep. And then you have a new tree. Now that's yes. not so hard, is and, it? And so from this point on, this tree will always produce Ribston Pippin, and these lower branches will continue to produce Macintosh. Right. How long do we wait? Oh, two years. Two years, and they, you'll start They'll to... grow out the first year, and you can have fruit of this new variety within two years. How great. So what is the oldest variety of apple that you grow? One of them is this Franc Rambour. Mm. It comes from France in the early 1500s. Mm, that's Another, a very nice apple. Yes, a nice one for cooking. Mm. It holds its shape well, has that a tartness to it. Well, I suggest that any of you looking for a new and different apple experiment, grow your own, of course, but also try the different apples that you find in the farmer's market. Well, thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us, and, uh, and we uh, welcome you as a guest to Martha Bakes. It's so, so great to have you. Thank you very much for having me and the apples. Yes, thank you so thank much. You. This slab pie, filled with a flavorful combination of apples topped with cinnamon swirled pat brise, is not only unique, it's extraordinarily delicious. We start with the basic pat brise, two and a half cups of all purpose flour, a tablespoon of sugar, one and a half teaspoons of salt. And I like to mix that up. And I make my pat brise in a food processor to save time. And two and a half cups of flour at a time is probably the best proportion to make in the food processor, especially since we're using two sticks, half a pound of unsalted ice cold butter cut into small cubes, like quarter inch cubes. Very nice to cut right into the dry ingredients. And just pulse for a couple seconds. And now add down the feed tube between a quarter and a half a cup of iced water. Just drizzle it in and pulse at the same time. Form this into a rectangle, wrap with plastic wrap, and refrigerate for at least two hours. So make this again and chill both rectangles until you're ready to assemble your delicious slab pie. So now I'm rolling one of our chilled rectangles of pat brise into a rectangle, approximately 12 by 17 inches to fit an ordinary jelly roll pan. Now this is still cold enough so I can just lift it into the pan. Notice I have a piece of parchment right in the bottom of the pan. Put this in the pan and then your excess can be just folded down. Just press this right into the edges of the pan. Once this is done, put this right back into the refrigerator and chill again for at least 30 minutes. And this is where your filling will be placed. Now here's our second sheet of pastry and we're making the cinnamon filling for the roll. And this is four tablespoons of unsalted butter, a half a cup of light brown sugar packed, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt, and a teaspoon of cinnamon, ground cinnamon. Mix that all together. Just enough to spread and give a good flavor to the swirls that are going to go on top of our apple slab pie. So now put this on your pastry dough and spread as much of your filling as possible all over the pastry. 
and now roll from the long end. You want a nice tight roll. So wrap this well with the same parchment paper and refrigerate for another 30 minutes or so. You can even put it in the freezer to speed it up. So now for the filling. Toss together four pounds of apples and you can use all assorted apples. Peel them and cut them into quarter inch slices. Then add a quarter teaspoon of salt to three tablespoons of all purpose flour. This will help thicken the juices of these juicy apples. Add that to six tablespoons of sugar and add this to your apples. But before I do that, I just want to add my lemon juice. Apples really respond very well to fresh lemon juice. So two tablespoons of lemon juice. Toss the apples around a little bit. Also a sprinkling of vanilla one teaspoon of vanilla just sprinkled over the apples. Toss that around. Add your sugar and flour mixture. Crispy, tart, ripe apples. These will look very pretty and taste very good. And these go right into your crust. Remember, the crust has been chilled coax them into every nook and cranny. Now, two tablespoons of butter cut into tiny pieces, just dot here and there on the top of your slab pie. And your oven should be preheated to 425 degrees. So here is our chilled cinnamon roll. You want to get about, oh, 63 slices. Calculate the center. Makes it easier if you cut into quarters and then into eighths. And each eighth will be cut into eight slices. And then you're going to shingle the top of your pie with these beautiful slices. So just continue slicing and arranging until you have the entire top of your slab pie covered with these glorious spirals. Then, once chilled, beat up one large egg and just very lightly brush the tops of the spirals. Adds a little bit of color, and we're going to sprinkle some sugar. Now this will be a very juicy slab pie because of all those apples. Um, you can put a baking sheet lined with foil right underneath this one to catch any of the drips. And get this right into your preheated oven. Looks spectacular now, but wait till you see it already baked. After 20 minutes, reduce the oven temperature to 375 and continue baking until the crust is golden brown. It takes about an hour. So here's our beautiful slab pie. Let cool completely on a rack. This cinnamon swirl apple slab pie takes pie making to a new next level. If you love caramel apples, this cake is for you. Three layers of delicately spiced apple cake are filled and frosted with a tangy swoop of cream cheese frosting, transforming a simple weeknight treat into a dessert worthy of any celebration. Start with your dry ingredients, two cups of all-purpose flour, two teaspoons of baking soda, half a teaspoon of baking powder. Check the freshness of your baking powder. Sometimes when we haven't baked in a long time, we realize that the baking powder is a year or two old. We don't want that three quarters of a teaspoon of salt measured in quarter teaspoons, two teaspoons of cinnamon. Cinnamon is such a great flavor. And a half a teaspoon of ground fresh ginger, just fragrant ginger. So these are our dry ingredients. And then in a larger bowl, one stick of unsalted melted butter and two large eggs. And two cups of light brown sugar, packed. If you didn't pack this, you wouldn't get a full cup. And mix this together. Whisk until all the lumps disappear. Add a little bit of the dry ingredients at a time. 
We were making three layers, eight inches by two inches. Now, two apples have been cored and diced, and two apples are peeled, cored, and grated. I'm gonna add the diced apples, and that's where you get the moist, delicious apple flavor from. And for this cake, we want to use a nice tart apple. Granny Smith's work very well in this cake, and the grated apples add a lot more moisture. So here we've started to grate, put that in. And stir all the apples into the batter. We want to divide this evenly amongst our three pans. They are buttered and lightly floured, and you can line the bottom with a piece of parchment if you like, so that the cakes come out more easily. Your oven should be preheated to 350 degrees. Bake for 35 to 40 minutes. So now we're making the cream cheese frosting. Three eight ounce packages and three sticks of unsalted creamery butter at room temperature. The cream cheese should also be at room temperature. And just mix that together until it's smooth. I'm gonna add two pinches of salt. And with a big spoon, just add sifted powdered sugar. Turn it down low, otherwise you'll have sugar everywhere. And we have five cups. And just beat until smooth. You don't want to overbeat. You don't want a lot of air bubbles in your beautiful creamy frosting. Now we can ice our cake. So we want one cup, two scoops of frosting between each layer. Mm, it's so beautiful. And I'm using a turntable, which really facilitates frosting a cake, turning it as you frost, really nice. And the next layer, I can see how moist this cake is. It is so moist, so beautiful. A rich and delectable cake. And what's nice about it too is that it is a butter cake, not an oil cake, which I prefer. And our final layer is about maybe three scoops. And the way to get a nice straight side is to hold your spatula perpendicular to the top of the cake. And I think that is a gorgeous cake. You can continue to fool with the top if you like. Once it's chilled and put on a pedestal like this, you can decorate with pretty apple slices that have been dried in the oven. Enjoy. Marie Rose grew up in France, in Paris, in a home surrounded by women who loved to bake. Today, she's sharing a classic baked apple dish and a favorite cookie she learned from her grandmother. And I'm very happy to have you here today, Marie. Thank you, it's, I'm happy uh, to be here. I'm going to follow Marie's instructions for her baked apples. So I have to core the apples for you, right? Yes, okay. please. And, and I'll can... do the, the filling. Okay. We have six tablespoons of unsalted butter and a quarter cup sugar plus two tablespoons. And if you want to core your apples easily, use one of these serrated edge apple corers. So what I'll do is to give a little more flavor, I'll also add some orange zest to the filling. So there, these are honey crisps. These are honey crisps, they hold well. They're pretty and very flavorful, I find. I won't do all the orange, I'll just do the half. And it smells so good. And you fill with a pastry bag? Yes. That would be the easiest way to put it into the center of the apples. Would then, you like to try one? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Squeeze right into the middle, right? Right. And I have a little bit of water, which we'll put in the bottom so it doesn't dry out too much. And how long do these bake? Do you get them, do they start to crack or? So they will start to crack, and it's important that they do. It means they'll release their juice in the middle of cooking. You can baste them once or twice. They cook for about 40 to 50 minutes. Right here? And the water in the that's, bottom. That's all, okay. Yes. Into the oven, 350 for? 40 minutes okay. to 50 minutes. The cookie I make with toasted flour. You put the flour in the oven at 350, and then it's gonna start coloring, and that's what you want. It's gonna give the flour a little taste of nuts, and 
it, it makes the cookie yeah, a little different. Yeah, it certainly does. It has a very different taste than white flour. What's particular to the cookie is also um, the egg that we put with it. It's cooked egg yolk, ah. which will make the cookie more crumbly. And so mm -hmm. you take your hard-boiled yolk and pass it through a sieve. It's quite unusual to find cooked egg yolks in, in recipe. recipes. Oh, very, very um, unusual. I learned it um, at one of the restaurants that I worked at. You get what's underneath as well, and then you can add the flour. Oh, great. So to those three egg yolks, you're going to add one cup plus three quarters of a cup and an additional tablespoon of toasted flour. So that already looks so good and, so and different. We, yeah. Yes, and so I'm going to add the sugar, half a cup and two tablespoons. I learned to bake with cups and tablespoons in Paris, actually, because I was buying uh, American baking oh, books. Oh, I see. Okay. And so I started to learn about we need butter. The European butter I like because it's a little more fatty. It mm -hmm. has more taste. Is it all unsalted? It's not. It's going to be seven tablespoons unsalted and 11 tablespoons oh. salted. Oh, so that's how you're going to get the salt in there, okay. Yes, exactly. And do you make this by hand? Ever use yes. a machine? Well, it depends. If I do it at home, I'll use my hands. If I do it at work, I'll do it with the machine. And if I do it at home, my kids will help me, and I'll try not to get mad because it's all <laughs> over the floor. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are, and that I will roll to a parchment paper. Okay. And then we can refrigerate it, and when it's cold... You slice it? Yes, Oh, exactly. easy. So here is our log, all cold. Yes, now it's chilled. We're gonna cut uh, slices about half an inch thick. Mm. I'll just remove everything. Thank you. When it bakes, even if it crumbles now, it's going to come back together. So it's a dry and crumbly but delicate dough. Oh, beautiful. Six is good for the half okay. sheet tray. And I can egg wash them and spread a little ginger powder on top. And we'll prepare another cookie sheet for the next six and transfer to a 350-degree oven for how many minutes? It's going to be about 12 minutes. Oh, okay. And you like to turn them during baking? I will turn the tray. Okay. Yes. So a little bit of the beautiful sauce. Yes. <gasps> Butter, sugar. Yum. There's nothing better. And now the apples are ready to welcome the raspberry jam. Oh, so where do you put that? Right in the middle? Yes, <gasps> right here. Oh, great. Now, do you make your own raspberry jam? I do. And a few hazelnuts. Really, the better ones are the ones from Italy. Oh, yes. But you can find hazelnut everywhere. Toast them a little bit and then sprinkle the apples with that. Now we have the cookies also that are ready. And... As they are very crumbly. So delicate. Very delicate. Like sand dollars. So we'll use a little spatula and put them on the side. What a magnificent dessert. Simply beautiful. Marie, thank you very much for coming today. And, thank you. Uh, thank you all for watching. And we'll see you on the next episode of Martha Bakes. When you make a pie and have leftover crust, my idea is to break them in pieces. Make a mix of pistachio powder, sugar, coconut, and cardamom powder. Take your little bits, dip them in melted butter, completely coated. Bake 10 minutes, 350, and you'll get crispy little bites. Serve them on top of whipped cream. You can also put them with applesauce. It's a really nice dessert. Bon appetit!